afternoon. Wow, that was a really impressive introduction. Yeah. I was standing back there going, who are they talking about? <clears throat> We've done a ton. Um, so the description of today's program says it's not recommended for those who are easily offended. And the reason is that you're about to hear a program <laughs> that will include um, incest jokes, bestiality jokes, a lot of obscenity, uh, the N-word, uh, scatological humor. And so for those of How you many of you came because of that? <laughs> Tell the truth. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I, I kind of said that as a joke, but not really. No, so that's good Cause, to know. Because that's a point I want to bring up. Yeah, and for any of you who didn't catch the warning, I just want to say welcome. Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul Provenza, very excited to be here. Um, You've had a long career as a comic and an actor. I and should a be writer, so much producer. bigger than I am. You're really. like 110. I am and, um, 110. But then in 2005, you became a filmmaker. So I just want to start with that. That you made a movie <laughs> called The Aristocrats. I did. And I just Guilty. want to ask, why make a movie about a dirty joke? What's the deal? Well, the the truth about that particular movie is it, it wasn't really about a dirty joke. It was about a joke that the whole exercise. I'm sorry. Could you bring this down just a touch because I'm getting a lot of feedback and it, it's. Um, bringing out the animal in me. I could snap at any moment. Uh, um, it, w the exercise was in uh, uh, interpretation. It was essentially, the, the premise of it was Penn Jillette from Penn and & Teller, and I uh, always thought it was interesting that, you know, you hear jazz musicians play over the same songs, and it, you know, it almost becomes a rite of passage for certain jazz musicians to do certain standards, do their interpretations of it, and we always felt like jazz and comedy are integrally related, and um, so we thought nobody's ever done that with comedy, because in their own work, people don't do the same material over and over, so we thought, what would be the perfect joke for this exercise of having everybody interpret a joke their own way? And the first one that popped into our heads was the aristocrats because it's a setup and a punchline and the middle is wide open. That's really why we chose the joke. And there aren't many jokes like that. Uh -huh. um, I'm sure if we had given it a little more thought, we might have been able to come up with another. <laughs> but we also thought in terms of doing, pursuing this exercise of comedy as jazz, that using that joke in particular would raise a whole lot of other levels that would say a lot about the art form and the um, uh, uh, interpretation of it as well and we didn't know exactly what it was going to be that we that we created we just figured we'd go and see what happened so that's really why we chose the joke we didn't set out to go let's do the most offensive joke possible by as many people we said let's examine a jazz format uh -huh. for comedy and it happened to be the filthiest, the filthiest joke, in the joke world. ever yeah um, so I want to read uh, just a few sentences from the New York Times review of your movie uh, so A.O. Scott said, uh, The Aristocrats is an essay film, a work of painstaking and penetrating scholarship, and as such, one of the most original and rigorous pieces of criticism in any medium I have encountered in quite some time. It is also yeah, possibly... There's your New York Times for you. <laughs> It is also possibly the filthiest, vilest, most extravagantly obscene documentary ever made. So I just want to say kudos for that. Um, My mother's very proud. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. So I want to show a clip from the aristocrats. So we're all on the same page here. So buckle up. Um, so, uh, <laughs> this, uh, so the joke's not usually told in front of audience. This is part of the premise that Paul takes us backstage, uh, comedians telling this joke to each other, and the, the lore and the legend and the practice of this joke. But this clip is a time in which an, one of the unusual circumstances in which the joke is told for an audience by Gilbert Gottfried. And um, it is told in a very unusual moment in time, so... Well, it, it, the audience in front of which it's told is the Friars Club. Yeah. It was a uh, Friars Roast for Hugh Hefner, uh, which, uh -huh. uh, so it's not really a general audience. No, it's, it's an a lot audience of, of comedians. <laughs> so it's an audience of people who are sort of aware of, of the phenomenon of it. Um, but it was um, about three or four weeks after September 11th, yeah. which was a very odd time, uh, almost existential for comedians because the clubs in New York we're actually calling each other, you know, weeks later going, are you opening this week? I don't know, what are you doing? What the, so there's this existential place of, are we, uh, should we be allowed to exist and do what we do yet? You know, very odd, very weird. Um, uh, and, um, and there were a lot of questions about it. Uh, and this actually 
was a performance that kind of broke that a little bit, and what you see is the audience reacting, basically, sort of like bursting a bubble. I mean, it's, it's more about the fact that we're laughing at stuff we're not supposed to laugh at, but it's not the thing that we're not supposed to laugh at, so it kind of bridged a gap a bit. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after this, the, the Onion came out with their, um, or around the same time, right, maybe even a little before, the Onion came out with their post-9-11 issue, which was brilliant and really deft in terms of acknowledging and addressing what had happened in a way that is, is funny but also um, really heartfelt and genuine. Uh, and not uh, mocking of victims, you know, it, it didn't pick the wrong targets. Um, and, and so this was a point in time that kind of like things got back on track in terms of us not knowing whether or not it was quote unquote time to laugh. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and let's play the- well, I just have to tell you one other oh, thing okay. that before this, Gilbert had done a joke. Uh, um, the, the host of the, of the event was Jeffrey Ross. Yeah. Uh, and um, Rob Schneider had come on, done a set that didn't work. A lot of people were doing material that didn't work, not because it was about anything wrong, just because everybody was sort of morose and nobody was really in the right headspace. Uh, and by the way, this, this event was a charity for victims of 9-11. They raised over $3 million. Um, uh, but, Jeff, uh, but Rob Schneider had done a set, didn't do well, and then Jeffrey Ross came on to take him off and said, uh, thank you, Rob, uh, really, um, haven't we had enough bombing in this city already? <laughs> yeah, he talks about that in the clip. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so he does talk yeah, about the clip. Yeah. But then Gilbert comes up and he opens with a, a piece where he just goes, he says, I have a flight. Oh yeah, he does yeah, talk he about it. About He'll that, tell you about yeah. that in, in the clip as well. So I'll just shut up and, and that's the context. Uh, uh, what I love about that clip is that... I know what you love the, about that clip. The other thing I love about that clip <laughs> is um, that... So, so it starts out that Gottfried is making jokes about 9-11. And in a room of largely comedians, I don't know what the percentage is, his peers shout, too soon! Well, and so he, he, he goes to this Freudian orgy, you know, of this other joke. But so in terms of crossing the line... Does that mean that he crossed a line? Like, did his, did his colleagues, did the audience tell him There's that that was too much and so he went to this other thing? Really what? what went on there, which is very interesting, I think, is that he was basically slapping them on the wrist for slapping him on the wrist. Okay. What he was doing there was he was going too soon. He was saying to his peers yeah. and, and professionals, you know, who came before him, he was saying, what do you mean too soon? And he was basically reminding them that, no, we're supposed to be crossing lines. We're supposed to be challenging whether or not it's too soon. We're, suppo we're not supposed to be playing it safe. And, uh, and that was sort of his way of slapping them on the wrist for slapping him on the wrist. And um, uh, that whole audience got it. Uh -huh. They really did. They got it. And even people who, who uh, you know, would normally, you know, people who were clean, people who make a whole, you know, an issue of the fact that they don't, you know, offend anybody in their audience, uh, got it, uh -huh. and um, and it really did. It really did kind of change the vibe of the whole sort of comedy world in New York a little bit. Interesting, interesting. Um, can you think of a time in your own career where you feel like you've gone too far? Maybe you said a joke and then later regretted it, or an audience response gave you a different perspective on it. Uh, daily. <laughs> Do you want to pick any one of those? Really, daily. Like well, I have the written the, mo I have written the most offensive joke in the world. Have you? Yeah, and that's not just my opinion. This it's is been not corroborated. a setup. This is not no, a setup. No, it's been corroborated <laughs> by the Rand Corporation. It's, it's actually been quantified. It is, in fact, the most offensive joke I'm in the world. I'm glad that you've reached the level in your career where you get Rand to tell yes, you where your jokes very, rank. The, the government is discussing its military uses. <laughs> All right. Uh, but I can't, I can't it? tell it to you people. <laughs> what? This audience can't take it, can no, they? No, no. It's the, it's the vilest joke ever, seriously. Anyway, but, um, well, I'll tell you what, no, I had, I had an interesting, first of all, I mean, there's so many things to talk about. We could really go on for hours and hours and hours, and only I would be interested. But um, <laughs> there, there, there's so many levels to this. You know, first of all, there's the level of what's the deal with crossing lines? Like, why right. is that part of the sort of caveat? Should, and, should we and, throw out this concept of lines? Like, there's no, we don't have the legal lines. Why do, is that the wrong framing altogether? Maybe? It's, it's, we could go on forever. I mean, the, the line yes. is not really a line. The way I always describe it is it's not a line, it's a point. And if you're making a point, the line is irrelevant. 
um, that, and the line shifts with every individual, with every group of individuals that make up an audience uh, from on a day-to-day -day basis, it shifts and changes. Um, um, and that doesn't matter. None of that ever matters if you're making a point. Uh -huh. um, which is why, you know, like Lenny Bruce's work was so pointed, was so socially and culturally critical and, and from such a real healthy progressive mm -hmm. value that um, it doesn't matter what lines you cross. That's irrelevant mm -hmm. because those lines are vague and ambiguous and uh, no matter how accepted they may be by any given community, there was a point to be made. You know, I always, I, I try to remind people all the time that Jonathan Swift, who was writing in the 18th century, uh, you know, he was, he wrote a, uh, a piece where he, um, he, his idea to solve the problem of um, starving, uh, starving Irish, modest proposal. yeah, modest proposal, yeah, uh, was to feed you know Irish babies to people, because they had a problem of overpopulation and the Brits were starving and they said, well, let's eat Irish babies, and um, still to this day, I was talking to a, a literature professor who said that still to this day he has to clarify to people that this was not reportage. Right. Because it's believable when you look at it in the context of you know the inhumanity that 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 took place in you know parts of the world at that time and even today. Um, uh, but in his own day, he was misunderstood, and um, that's something that happens a lot. And to me, that's the most interesting kind of comedy, where the joke becomes not so much the actual comedy, but how you receive it. That's what Andy Kaufman made his uh, um, uh, breakthroughs with. Andy Kaufman, in a very Picasso-like way, he sort of obliterated the edges of the canvas. He took the joke from the stage and put it into the audience. The punchline was not anything that he did on stage. The punchline was in the fact that half the audience understood and the other half didn't. And the joke was that the audience was all making fun of each other through the entire thing for going, you didn't get it, you got it, I don't get it, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> the, the punchline had nothing to do with the joke anymore. It had to do with how the joke was received. Right. You know, on that note, maybe we should talk about uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, because he's another person who goes into the audience in a different way. Um, the comedian who made Borat and Bruno, and in that sense, he's, he's playing a character and going out and interacting with people and the humor um, some would say, comes from the reactions of the people to him. Um, I, should we look at the clip or? No, let's just think about let's it. Let's just think. Mm. <laughs> Remember back to seeing that. Yeah, let's uh, watch it. This is supposedly track four. Let's watch a clip of uh, from Borat. Bruno comes out Tuesday. Sorry, I couldn't They don't kiss you. No, why not? The people that do the kissing over here are the ones that float around like that. Are they all alone? Yeah, stay away from them to kiss. Okay. You don't want nobody kissing. In my country, yeah. they uh, take them and they take them to jail and finish take them. Take them out and hang them. Yes. That's what we're trying to get done here. High five. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of Salem, Virginia, would you please give a warm American welcome to a gentleman who has come all the way from Kazakhstan. And we are honored to have singing our national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, Barat Sakia. My name is Borat. I come from Kazakhstan. Can I say first, we support your war of terror. May we show our support to our boys in Iraq. May USA kill every single terrorist. May George Bush drink the blood of every single man, woman, and child of Iraq. May you destroy their country so that for the next thousand years, not even a single lizard will survive in their desert. <laughs> to show our friendship, I now will sing our Kazakh national anthem to the tune of your national anthem. Listen. Kazakhstan is the greatest country in the world. All of the countries are run by little girls. Kazakhstan is number one 
exporter of potassium. Other Central Asian countries have inferior potassium. Anytime you can close on inferior potassium, I think you should just bring it, bring it there. That, uh, that song is second only to throw the Jews down the well. Yeah, which, yeah uh, the running is another, of the Jews at yeah. the beginning. So yeah. what do you think of Cohen's work? So other comedians are playing themselves, they're up on stage, they're saying, you know, speaking their mind. He's playing a character, he's getting unsuspected people. And I'm one of those people, when I was in seventh grade, my dad took me and Leslie Umberger to see Andy Kaufman, and when he wanted to wrestle really? women from the audience, we were like, and my dad's like, no, 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 you don't want to do that. Like, my dad got it in a way we didn't. We thought it was fun. Um, but so he's got unsuspected... I'd like to wrestle you. I, Again, if you pay extra, we'll stay. By the um, way, just a quick aside, I did wrestle Ann Coulter to the ground in the green room of, of Politically Incorrect once. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it was Ooh. awesome. Did just she hair challenge pulling, you like to that? Actual wrestling. Actually, just kind of happened. So many things, It was things awesome. Do. It was a little hot. I don't mind telling you. <laughs> anyway, Just kind of happened. Um, <laughs> yeah. We'll investigate that later. Um, so... What do you think? So he's in the crowd. He's got people who think they're seeing one person. They're not seeing that person. Then they're up on him film. What do you think of his work? Is he the, people I, I, say he's I think the new Lenny Bruce. He's pushing uh, the pushing the boundaries. I, I, um, uh, I don't think that he's as socially significant as Lenny Bruce was in his day, but I do think he's brilliant. I think what he does is very complicated and very sophisticated. It's, it's hard to talk about him in, in, in completely unqualified because there's a certain disingenuousness to what he does. What's that? Uh, well, in that he claimed that, say, in this, in this movie, that he was exposing anti-Semitism that already exists, when the truth is really he did a lot of entrapment mm -hmm. of people into and appearing to be anti-Semitic. Anti so. And in, again, a little, there's a little disingenuousness in the fact that um, uh, a number of these people were, they actually got the joke and were playing along with him. Uh, and in fact, there were some legal battles because people said that they were mischaracterized in a way that, that was libelous for them. Um, so, you know, that gets into a whole other area, which mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the quality or, or the tone of his work, but has to do with a certain, um, a certain conflict between going for the laugh and really making your point or, or any sort of, you know, to what standard are you going to be held to as a creative artist? Should you be held to the standards of journalism? Should you be held to the standards of, uh, you know, uh, legal issues of libel well, and slander and stuff? So, so it's, a it's a complicated thing. But, and I don't know if you notice, actually, in that clip, uh, you see people applauding and cheering at certain points that are very funny to us in a, in a shocking way and in a way that's trying to make a point. But if you notice behind him, the rows and rows of people behind him aren't really reacting that way. So again, there's a certain evidence of the disingenuousness of it all. The editing. But having said all of that, I do think that he enters into some very complicated territory that it, it, doesn't, it almost doesn't matter what he's saying in certain places because it just raises so many interesting questions. For example, the scene where, he's, uh, where he defecates in a plastic bag and brings it down, he's at that, that, that dinner party uh, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, spoiler alert! Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, when I watched that, I thought to myself, I thought, you know, he's making somebody look foolish who was really trying to understand yeah. and show compassion to someone who claims to be ignorant of our ways and culture. Right. And um, by being a decent person, to somebody else and not just snapping and going, what are you, an idiot? And actually trying to reason with them from a very civilized and understanding, compassionate standpoint, he then made them look foolish. And that's how far he had to go before they would break and push their buttons and say, get out exactly. of my house. So, like so, he had to do something so outlandish, which any one of us would probably say, that's really So my, my don't feelings do that about at my movies party. like Borat are, are a little bit complicated by yeah. those things, although those things are all interesting things to think about and interesting things right. to feel. Um, uh, but in short, I do think that he's absolutely brilliant. His level of commitment is astonishing. Right. You know, and um, and he enters into real interesting shades of gray. Wow. You know, um, he certainly um, puts himself at risk. He certainly does put himself at risk. Yeah, and there are some times where I agree that he should have the shit beat out of him. You know, he's <laughs> basically asked for it. You know, um, uh, but he yeah. is uh, again, regardless of how you feel about it, he is taking chances in the art form. He is pushing it in certain ways, and 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 really putting himself at risk. Uh, and his level of commitment is just, you know, noteworthy. One of 
the one of the critiques of him is that he's actually not taking as big of risk as it seems like because he's by um, playing a character that we sensitive liberal types know we're not supposed to laugh at, like the foreigner or the stereotypical flamboyant, ridiculous, heightened, exaggerated gay person in Bruno. We don't want to laugh at that, but because theoretically the jokes on the, the people reacting to him, we are then given permission to laugh at these stereotypes and that it's no different than a white person putting on blackface and playing Mammy that, that, that in Bruno he's putting on pink face because he's not gay and he's playing this exaggerated character. Is there anything to that? Yes, and I think that's all part of the many, many layers to what he's doing, which is why any criticism I have of what he does or any, any moments where I feel like, oh, that is not, there's some lack of integrity there or there, uh, ultimately or irrelevant because he's, he's really taking chances. He really fucks with your head. He just yeah. fucks with your head. Even, and not only in terms of what he's actually doing, but in terms of how you're receiving it and how the people next to you are receiving it. It just operates in constant shades of gray at many different levels. And that to me is always compelling and interesting. Having said that though, his work as, um, um, uh, who do you call it? Um, the, the, the TV show. Uh, thank Ali you, G. Ali G. His work as, uh, as Ali G is really interesting yeah. because that's a character that he, ta he takes that can out, and he, in America this, this was true, the American version this was true, but more so in the British version. By embracing that character the way he, to the degree that, uh, to which he did, and, and interviewing members of parliament and journalists and TV uh, uh, commentators and things, and really uh, you're really getting to see those people trying to navigate that character. Uh, there, that was a much more interesting and much richer kind of challenge, I think, than than some of the stuff that that, that you've seen in Borat and Bruno. Um, uh, but again, that's just to speak to really that he is a guy with a vision. He is a guy who is working within the art form of comedy with a vision and with an understanding of an art form and with an understanding of its limitations and, and, and what's already generally accepted and what is possible or what might be possible or, you know, so I give him all kinds of, all kinds of slack for, for hitting or missing any given marks because he is really, really doing some bold work. Yeah. I mean, he's really operating on a lot of right. levels. I, I truly believe that his is the kind of comedy that you could do, you know, a thesis on if there were a course in college respecting comedy as that kind of an art form. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's that complicated. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I want to go to I, what I believe is track two, the Chris Rock clip, because we've talked about this shift from legal standards and legal lines that we've gotten away from to cultural norms. So in the case of the Aristocrats clip, we saw sort of where if it's a topic like 9-11 or if it's obscenity and the audience deciding. And in this clip, Chris Rock, actually in the middle of his uh, routine from Kill the Messenger a year ago, uh, talks about what he thinks some of the lines are. Um, and I just want to say the reason he's in four different outfits is it was taped in four different uh, concert venues. It's not that I edited it to create, to have him say something he didn't really say. So let's try to play that. Yeah. Race, man, big man. We live in a crazy time, man. We live in an insane time, man. We live in a time where, it, where you, if you say the wrong thing, you in trouble. We live in, this is the first time in the history of the world where white men actually have to watch what they say. White men are getting in trouble for saying the wrong words, man. It's unbelievable, man. And a lot of white guys, hey man, that's not fair. You, you can say whatever you want. You can say nigger. Yeah, when I last checked, that was the only advantage I had to being black. <laughs> you want to switch places? You scream nigger and I'll raise interest rates. <laughs> yeah, it's the first time in the history of the world well, white men have to watch their tongue. And you know, white guys, don't, don't, don't worry about it. You know, that's how life works, man. That's how life works. Sometimes the people with the most shit have to shut up and let other people talk shit about them. <laughs> that's how life works, that's right. Sometimes the people with the most shit get to say the least shit. And the people with the least shit get to say the most shit. So if you want to say most shit, get rid of some of your shit. That's how the world works, man. Some people get to talk about other people, and that's, how, that's just how it goes, man. For instance, like, fat girls can say whatever they want to about skinny girls. <laughs> fat girls could talk about skinny girls all day long. Fucking skinny bitch, fucking skinny ass, anorexic, bulimic, fucking regurgitating bitch, fucking. 
Cheerio belt wearing bitch. Salad eating motherfucker. Hope she chokes on a crouton. But skinny girls can't talk about fat girls. That's just me. Look at these big bitches. Do they freebase gravy? So it was just funny to me that in the middle of his routine, he kind of lays down, like, here are the rules of who gets to make fun of who. And I just want to ask, is he right? Can you only joke up? And is it true that the people underneath, uh, whatever pecking order you establish, can say anything they want? Uh, uh, I happen to agree. Right. I, I happen to think he's 100% right. All right. Uh, as my friend Patrice O'Neill puts it, black women can say any fucking thing they want. <laughs> white women can say the next amount of shit. Then black men, and white men can't say shit about anything. Uh, and that's really how And that's how, how you're living out. your life. That's how you're, your credo now for your art. You can't say shit. Uh, no, oh, I, no I, I, don't, um, I don't consider myself a white man. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it gets down to the question of, of, of victim. Who's the victim, you know? And as, um, oh, I've heard it accredited to Chaucer. I've heard it accredited to uh, um, um, a journalist whose name escapes me at the moment from the 19th century, uh, but that the, um, the job of a satirist is to uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Uh, or as I think it was um, Voltaire said, uh, I would rather um, vex the world than amuse it. Uh, I'm paraphrasing about all these things. Uh, and um, uh, so the question is, who's, who is your victim? You know, I mean, why do we want to make jokes about rape victims? Why do we want yeah, to make do jokes we do about, that? about, <laughs> why do we want to make jokes about people who are suffering and who are, who are you know, more unfortunate than, than we are, or people who are victims of a power structure? You know, what's the point of that? Well, it's like anything else. I mean, if you're Wagner and you're an anti-Semite Nazi, do you want to do, you know, music about that? Or do you want to do, you know, if you're Lenny Riefenstahl, do you want to make a film supporting the Nazi regime? Or do you, as a human being, with your own artistic integrity, choose not to put that forth? And the same standards apply across any art form, any, pretty much anything you do, you know? Um, so, yeah, there is that truth to it. Um, the interesting thing, though, is how one is often confused for the other. How a lot of, you know... Um, Chris Rock is a really great example in this conversation all over the place because he really is fearless and he really has done his homework. He, he, when he looks at who the victim is and he looks at what exactly his point is, he doesn't take sides. Uh, you know, his, his piece on uh, nigger is phenomenal where he talks about there's black people and there's niggers and the niggers have got to go, you know, that there are black people who know that there are, you know, he brings up issues of class, mm -hmm. that it's not race, it's class. And, and, and his thing about what, what real wealth is, you know, you think Oprah Winfrey's wealthy? Fuck that. Who signs Oprah's check? That's wealthy, you know? Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff is really, really penetrative and really thoughtful, and, um, and the victims are never really about what they seem to be on the surface. They're not about race, they're about other things. They're about power, they're about control, they're about you know, unseen truths. Uh, and, um, and then you know, there are people who do, do things that are misconstrued, you know? um, and, uh, and that's where it gets really complicated, is sometimes people don't understand who the victim is. I'll give you a personal example of this. And this happened to me very, very early on in my career. And this, this I really, I had been doing stand-up only for a few years. I was probably about 19 when, when I did this bit. And um, I started when I was like 16. And um, <clears throat> so early on, I realized that this was interesting territory and it kind of it became a, a, a bone of contention for me my whole life. But uh, I was in Philadelphia going to school at the University of Pennsylvania. And around that time, are you from Penn? Yes. Yeah, oh wow. So are you still paying off your loan? <laughs> oh, yeah, double whammy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, at the time in Philadelphia, there was a local story about uh, a guy named Jojo Giorgiani. And Jojo Giorgiani had been arrested and convicted of raping a 12-year-old girl. And he was in prison for several years. So you immediately thought, this is going to be hilarious. <laughs> a little. <laughs> no, but here's my point. 
He was convicted of raping a, a, a 12 year old girl and he was in jail for a few years and he was released uh, because his lawyer successfully argued that in putting him in, in a jail cell was cruel and unusual punishment and therefore unconstitutional because Mr. Giorgiani weighed 400 pounds. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Don't you intuitively sense there's comedy in here somewhere? So my joke was, uh, oh, I see how this works. He rapes a 12-year-old girl, and all of a sudden we're worried about him being in a tight place. And you were 16 when you told this no, joke, no, or 19? No, no, I was, I was 19. So you were of age. I was of age, yes. <laughs> um, but here's the point. You guys had a very mixed reaction, OK? Um, uh, the audiences back then with, uh, with my, um, um, what's the word, inchoate, uh, skills as a comedian, uh, um, it, it usually went south on me. And, um, uh, but it perplexed me because the values in the joke and the victim in the joke are all right and righteous, and I stand behind them. What I'm basically saying is, who gives a fuck that this guy is uncomfortable in a jail cell? He raped a 12-year-old girl. Right. But by, just by hearing, in a joke format, mm -hmm. rape 12-year-old girl, you know, immediately the judgments go, this, nothing about this is going to be funny. Now, you all here felt that as well, but you also, many of you, most of you, I would venture to say, balanced it with, oh, you know that this is what's going on there, and you see your way through it to understand the point. Um, but audiences very often don't do that and can't do that, and since the rise of political correctness as a doctrine, um, uh, nuance and irony and subtleties are uh, uh, really not appreciated. Uh, and that's one of the interesting cultural and social uh, uh, negatives about PC culture. And again, I'm, I'm using a very broad general term there, and I should really clarify that, which I will later on. Um, um, what's happened is, as Bill Burr, a phenomenal social critic comedian, said, uh, we've basically given psychopaths a roadmap to navigate it. You know, you could go to a dinner party and say the most horrible, racist, hateful things. We see politicians constantly engaging in intelligent rhetoric that is absolutely, purely 100% racist, and they're okay because they haven't said certain words. They've done it correctly and appropriately. So we've ended up sort of backing ourselves into a corner as we head towards a very laudable and well-intended, uh, um, you know, cultural shift. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and, and that's something that, that never really gets addressed. But we as artists, we feel it all the time. We feel all the time that we have, like, suddenly irony becomes uh, an obstacle to us rather than a tool. Mm -hmm. Well, so much of what you're saying it seems uh, dependent on intent, like trusting that the person is coming from this um, truthful place, this artistic place, this ambitious place of speaking, you know, something that hasn't, speaking truth to power, something that hasn't been said. What about just... Um, but having said that, that's not always the case. Right. Because having said that, like Chris Rock's piece, you know, he got a lot of flack from the black community, from his mm -hmm. own sort of core audience at the time. I mean, that particular piece and that special really broke it wide open to where he became, you know, his audience just became uh, way broader than yeah. it ever had been before. Um, but he got a lot of flack for it. Margaret Cho has been, you know, the subject of, of protests by Asian Americans uh, repeatedly in her, mm -hmm. in her career for just speaking the truth from a place that if you've ever seen Margaret Cho's work or you've ever spent any time with her or seen two frames of video on her, you know she is the antithesis of racist or anything. You know, she is just a complete love and peace freak, you know, and it's genuine it's, and, and it's sincere, but because she did an impression of her mother that some Asian Americans felt was a racist portrayal. The fact that it's her mother, who she loves, who she grew up with, and the fact that her mother actually fucking sounds like that <laughs> becomes irrelevant. So it's an odd place that we're in. Right. I think, should we open it up to the audience? And Absolutely. get some questions in. We have about 15 minutes, and I just want to, if there's topics you guys want to talk about, make sure there's an opportunity. Uh, yes, he was, actually, and we spoke the, the to Buddy. The question was, was Buddy Hackett still alive when the aristocrats was being made? Yeah, of course, he was one of the first people we thought of that we had to get in the thing, because actually there's a great story about Buddy Hackett and the aristocrats joke. Yeah, well, we spoke to him on the phone. First, he was very, he, 
he actually died in the process of making the movie. So when he, said, when he said he really wasn't feeling well and didn't really want to be on camera, you know, we can't really bitch about it because he went and fucking died and proved it. Um, uh, but he did do it over the phone, which was entertaining. Um, but um, Buddy Hackett actually, here's a great story, and, I, and I, it, it gets personalized. When I was a kid, I was watching Johnny Carson, and Buddy, you know, every time Buddy Hackett was on, it was an event, right? And um, uh, I don't know, he would just tell stories or just be Buddy Hackett. And he, it didn't seem like he was doing material or anything, he was just being funny Buddy Hackett. And one time he was on, and they cut away for a commercial, and they came back, and they came back to Johnny, just his head on the desk and pounding and weeping, and the audience absolutely in hysterics, and they'd cut to Buddy Hackett, and he would just be sitting there, you know. <laughs> and the play, it was like, like two minutes, of, they come back from a commercial to two minutes of nonstop laughter and um, never addressed it. And <laughs> so I always wondered what the hell was going on there. And when I had the chance many years later, in 1983, I mean, this was probably in 73, 72, maybe, that, I, that this happened. In 1983, I got the chance to do The Tonight Show and, uh, for the first time, and I'm waiting behind that curtain, and the stagehand, who always opens the curtain for the comedian to go out and hit his mark, had been there for like 30 years. And I'm waiting for you know, the commercial to end, and I'm about to be introduced, and I say to the guy, I go, you've been here for 30 some odd years? He goes, yep. I go, what, what happened the night that Buddy Hackett was on? And everybody was just laughing hysterically, and nobody said anything about it. And he said, uh, he said uh, well, they had cut for a commercial, and the band started, and uh, Buddy stopped the band. He said, hold on, hold on. He said, Johnny, do you mind if I tell a joke to the audience? And the audience, ah! so he went, sure. So Buddy began to tell the aristocrats joke. <laughs> but he timed it just perfectly so that by the time it was a four, three, two, he went, the aristocrats. And the cameras came up, and everybody just exploded. <laughs> he had timed it perfectly for that moment. So, yes, of course, Buddy Hackett. Was Dom DeLuise contacted? Um, I, don't, I don't know if I spoke to Dom DeLuise about this, but oh, have I got Dom DeLuise story for you later. <laughs> I'll say that. All right, <laughs> other questions. But also Rodney is another one that, I, that we really wanted in, uh, but um, he was uh, not, not very uh, well either. Paul, I know you've worked internationally. I don't know if you want to talk about the lines in the yeah, different that's interesting countries. Too. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, I, I've spent a lot of time working around the world, doing everywhere stand -up. from yeah, doing stand-up um, to uh, a massive community, a worldwide community of English-speaking expats uh, that are everywhere in great numbers. Um, you know, uh, and and there's usually a uh, radio, an English-speaking radio station wherever you are somewhere. So really, one radio interview and everybody you know knows you're <laughs> in town, and they'll come and see you. Um, everywhere from, you know, all throughout the Middle East, Qatar, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, Kuwait, uh, to, you know, Hong Kong and Beijing and Shanghai and various little small towns in China and, and um, Australia and New Zealand and all through Europe. Uh, I have dates coming up in Switzerland, actually, in a couple Mark of weeks. Mark your calendars. And, um, um, and it's English-speaking uh, English audiences. They're Americans, Canadians, Brits, South Africans, uh, Australians, uh, all m very different cultural uh, backgrounds, very different socioeconomic backgrounds, all working overseas, uh, really worldly. I mean, they, they have their own sort of cultural filters. Uh, also, they all know American culture because they all get every television show and movie. Um, and, um, but they've also lived around the world, so they filter it through a certain worldly perspective. And they're amazing audiences. And sometimes when you're working in certain parts of the world, they understand that there are lines there that aren't traditional for us, like a lot of countries in the Middle East, um, uh, even a country like the United Arab Emirates, which is a very, very light fundamentalist country, uh, they all have a, uh, an entirely separate world for Westerners because they, they depend on Westerners for business, for finance, for, you know, uh, all sorts of stuff. So they have accommodated Westerners, and there's a whole world of bars and nightclubs and restaurants and things that Westerners go to that their own people aren't allowed to go to, uh, that we're allowed to drink and do whatever. Um, uh, and there are these comedy events, they will send spies in just to make sure, you know, from the Ministry of Culture kind of 
Orwellian sounding offices, um, uh, just to make sure that you're not violating the most important thing, which is that you're not criticizing Islam. Uh, and uh, I have two friends who were actually deported early the next morning after having crossed the, uh, a line like that. Um, and uh, what's really cool about it, though, <laughs> is that the, uh, the English-speaking audience knows that this is the case there, and they really get a kick out of what's the most fun for a comedian in this day and age where really there, there's no danger in doing comedy here in America. I mean, you get, there's danger in terms of how the audience will react or you know, what, maybe your career can get hurt if you're at that particular profile, but there's no real danger. Like when Lenny Bruce went to jail and George Carlin had to go to the Supreme Court to defend his First Amendment rights, you know, there's none, none of that really exists here at all anymore. Uh, but over there, you can go to jail, you could lose a body part. And uh, that audience knows that you're really in dangerous territory, so it's really fun to try and do material that's anti-religious or is about Islam that they know you're not really not supposed to and everybody gets this sense of you are really walking a tightrope without a net here and it just charges everything in a way that you'll never really understand until you're until you're a comedian it's really like bungee jumping it's it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> the issue with Michael Richards a couple years ago you know we heard about that but in the, the journalistic point of view do you have, know anything about, you know, what the hell was he thinking in terms of... I happen to know a lot about and, it because... And maybe uh, share what that was for anyone who wasn't aware of the controversy with Michael Richards, the guy who played Kramer. Um, uh, well, actually, there's a phenomenal YouTube uh, piece where somebody did a dance mix of, of Michael Richards' uh, implosion at the Laugh Factory. Uh, does anybody not know what came down there at... at uh, why don't you tell the folks? <laughs> See, you can't even quote it. It's such an odd situation. Yeah. I spoke to a friend of mine who was a, um, she's a sociolinguistics professor at, um, uh, in Youngstown, and uh, she was doing a, 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 a course on, uh, uh, not a course, she was doing a, a class on the word nigger, the sociolinguistics behind the word nigger. It's cultural implications its origins, where it went to, how it's, how, you know, different permutations of it today, its social impact. We're just examining in an academic setting uh, the, the power of that word and its impact on culture and vice versa, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And she was fined and um, suspended for saying the word nigger in a sociolinguistics lecture about the word nigger. <laughs> so we're in really funky territory that just doesn't feel right to me, even though I'm so completely in agreement with, with you know, what's wrong about it. Mm -hmm. but, but anyway, the Michael, let me just finish the Michael Richards thing. The Michael Richards thing is way more complicated than the news made it out to be. First of all, the, you know, the, uh, the, the conventional wisdom on how that all played out ultimately in, in our world, in the world of, of comedy, is that what's really tragic is that Michael Richards became the poster child for 250 years of racism in America which is just inappropriate. You know, and at the same time that Michael Richards was getting coverage on the front pages of newspapers around this country, the fucking Jenna Six was actually happening. And more people knew about Michael Richards saying the word nigger at a comedy club in Los Angeles than knew that people were hanging black people in America in 2003, whatever it was. And that's what's really sickening, is that a lot of that kind of stuff becomes an obfuscation and becomes a diversion from real, palpable, systemic racism that persists to this day and is never addressed because a guy like Michael Richards or Don Imus gets taken down for having said a bad word and everybody sits back and goes, ah, well, see, we, did, we took care of that. And meanwhile, real, real, important, serious racism continues and it's revolted. What's going on in the justice system in this country is, is despicable. You know, what, what's the, the, the prison system in this country, how 25% of blacks between the ages of 18 and 25 are politically disenfranchised because they've done prison time and can't vote anymore. It's disgusting and it's persisting and nobody gives a shit about it, but everybody makes a fuss out of Don Imus and Michael Richards. So it's important to understand that stuff in a slightly different context to see how really uh, that whole thing became, what that really was about was celebrity. It wasn't about anything else. It was about celebrity. You know, it was about, it was no different than, you know, David Hasselhoff drunk trying to eat a cheeseburger while he's talking to his daughter. It's the same TMZ garbage, but 
it also gave a lot of self-righteous people the opportunity to not really address anything meaningful because they can sit back and tisk tisk about Michael Richards. So having said that, what really went on there was Michael Richards just have, you know, he was a guy who hung his guns up for 11 years and became a television superstar. And he went back to the old saloon and put his guns on and he didn't realize that the territory had changed, everybody in the place had changed, the world had changed as he'd been, he'd been gone, and he just couldn't really. And now he was a celebrity. And now he, he was a celebrity was gonna... and he couldn't handle it. I mean, Michael, uh, as, as Rick Overton, a brilliant uh, comedian, uh, said, it's not so much that Michael is a racist, he's a rageist. He snapped and he snapped because it wasn't racial at all, really because if they were handicapped people, then it would have been about handicapped people. If they were Chinese, then it would have been about Chinese people. If they were midgets, then it would have been about midgets. He just snapped, and he snapped because they said the worst, the equivalent of saying nigger to a black man is saying you're not funny to a comic on stage. And he just snapped, and he went down the road of trying to trying to, he went nuclear with it basically, that he tried to do something that if you were deft, if you hadn't hung your guns up for a while, if you had a sense of skill, if, you're, if you were in shape, if you had the ability to really read the room and understand it, you could say anything that you want. But he didn't have the, those tools at his disposal and he tried and he fucked up. But it wasn't about what everybody claims it was about, and the fact that he became this poster child for racism. The truth is, if he weren't a celebrity, I bet you there's, if you went to every comedy club in America that night, you would have seen that same incident seven, eight, ten times. It just happens, and, and it doesn't mean as much. But what's tragic to me is how, is how people made it into anything more than just a comic screwing up show, as if it mattered as if it made a difference to what really matters with race in this country. It's despicable. Mm -hmm. I want to ask, we're almost out of time, but I want to end on this. That, so you are someone who's you know, obviously involved in both making art and criticizing art and uh, in interviewing artists. You have a new book um, called Satirist is coming out that talks about 50 satirists and interviews them about their work. Um, so you're obviously a very liberal, open person. What offends you? Jews. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> what? Um, well, yeah, I, I guess you know what offends me is is um, is uh, is victimizing people who really don't deserve victimization, and more and in a bigger picture, a lot of what I was talking about is just sort of like uh, there, a certain self righteousness offends me, you know. Um, um, uh, I had a really interesting chat with Randy Newman, who's, uh, are any of you familiar with Randy Newman's work? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's stunningly brilliant. I mean, he does kind of like what Sasha Baron Cohen does in his own way. He really embraces vile, despicable characters and ideas and puts them forth and lets you be the judge. But in Sail Away mm -hmm. is a song where he basically is singing from the point of view of a, um, of a slave trader. Uh, who is trying to, is trying to convince Africans to get on the boat to become slaves. Mm -hmm. And he said it's like a, like a high school basketball recruiter trying to make it sound like it's, this is, you're gonna love this, you know? And it, with things like, uh, you know, you won't have to run through the jungle and scuff up your feet no more, you know? And it, it's great, you should come over to America and be a slave. Uh, really disturbing stuff, you know, uh, with these beautiful lilting songs and you find yourself singing along. He has a song called Rednecks, which is, uh, it's just heinous, the things that the protagonist of the song, the character that he's portraying as he sings it, uh, uh, is saying. And people, it's, it's, it's like a toe tapper and you're like, you know, you know, yeah, the niggers are free to be put in a cage in Roxbury and yada, yada, yada. It's really disturbing what happens to you with it. But that is from the point of view of a, a redneck racist and the, and the, the, the approach in this that he's making, and very complicated stuff, is the redneck is singing about the hypocrisy in uh, uh, white liberals. And he talks about this um, uh, audience of Jews. It, was, it, was ba it, it came about after Lester Maddox had appeared on the Dick Cavett Show. And Lester Maddox, I don't know if some of you don't know, was a governor of Georgia? Yeah, governor of Georgia well-known racist, uh, document, documented, no, you know, I mean, and had the audience given him enough rope, he would have hung himself, but the audience wouldn't let him speak. 
And so this audience of, as this redneck describes it, New York Jews, you know, refused to let Lester Maddox speak as if they all had black friends at home, you know? And, and, um, and so this redneck character is taking issue with the self-righteousness of New Yorkers who think that they're immune when, as he goes through the song, he talks about, yeah, maybe down south, we're, we're too ignorant to know that the nigger's been set free up north. And then he goes, yeah, but the nigger's been set free up north to live in cages in Watts and in the South Bronx and live in the cages of poverty in Roxbury and Boston, living in the uh, And it's really interesting. And what he was trying to say is that we, none of us, we're, when it comes to race in America, none of us have the moral high ground and that we're all responsible. And for those people to say, Lester Maddox, he's a bad person, we're okay because we're criticizing Lester Maddox is, is part of the problem, you know? And very touchy, dangerous area to get into, um, but he does it with an amazing commitment, and it ends up being very disturbing to listen to it because you feel things that, that are uncomfortable. And to me, that's brilliant satire and brilliant comedy because if, if you don't confuse or confound, as Mike Nichols puts it, if you don't confound with what you're doing, then you are um, uh, not really exploring it. And when you're in a position where you don't even know if you're the one being criticized anymore, you know, some work has been done, something meaningful has been done, some art has happened, you know? And that's the thing about crossing lines in comedy, is, is the lines are accepted, the lines are sort of notions that, that, that we put around our own sort of morality or a way we express our goodness and virtue that we don't cross these lines, whatever. But when you're taken across those lines and it gets complicated for you, you sometimes find out that the lines aren't necessarily what matter. It's what's in deep down inside. As, as, um, as um, Tim Reed said, uh, Tim and Tom were the first black-white um, uh, comedy team in America in the, in the uh, late 60s. The yeah. Oh, did they? Oh, they're so interesting, aren't they? Anyway, uh, you know, Tim Reed says, he says, you know, yeah, the Supreme Court can force you, if you're a racist luncheonette owner, the Supreme Court can force you to serve black people, but you're still going to hate black people. So really nothing's been accomplished in terms of you and your morality and your ideas, you know? And that's what Crossing Lines does. It puts you into the area that's uncomfortable for you, and sometimes what you find there is not as cozy as you thought it was. And that's an interesting thing, I think, for any art to do. And I often point to, I don't know if you have any of you seen the movie American Beauty? Mm -hmm. There's a, a beautiful scene in American Beauty where the odd, quirky kid who befriends the, the, the teenage girl, uh, he's showing her videos that he made, and he's doing this video of this garbage bag swirling around, and you know, just, just garbage swirling around. And he sits there and he muses on how beautiful it is. And so he has, like, and she's looking at him like, wow, you're weird, but she's getting into his head and you realize that the reason this guy is so odd and why they connect is because he sees beauty in, in something that everybody else thinks is just a, a, a social blight, litter, trash, but he's found a moment of beauty within that. And I think the greatest art does that, that what is dark or ugly or evil or any of those things, if you can turn it into something beautiful, I, I think you've done a little something good for the world. And, and, and a laugh, I don't care what the, what the source of it is, a laugh I think is just fucking beautiful. <laughs> and on that note, thank you. Thank you.